Um, I'd like to welcome you to our third US One Poets Invites in uh, our brand new library. And um, it's wonderful to see this group growing and growing. And we hope uh, you continue to grow and, and share poetry. Uh, I'm Susan Roth. I'm the Reader Services Coordinator here at the library. And um, it's, it's always my pleasure to be able to work with groups like US One to have such wonderful programs here at the library. Okay, now it's my pleasure to give the podium over to Ellen Foos, who will be introducing the poets tonight. Thanks. Welcome back to everybody who's here for the third or second or first time. Uh, it's going to be a really good program tonight. We have uh, Charles Johnson and ours, and then we'll take a short break, and then we'll have the open mic. So please do sign up you know, for the open mic. Uh, Charles, I have uh, read his uh, writing in print, but I've never actually had the pleasure of hearing him read, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, he has a book, Tunnel, Vi Tunnel Vision for Sale, in the back, and he's published in several prestigious places. Uh, I guess I don't need to go through those, but um, welcome to Charles. Thank you. From Patterson to Princeton, that's what I did today. I had the privilege of being the guest speaker at the Build Academy gradu eighth grade graduation. So I want to share a couple poems uh, that I read at that graduation for the students. <clears throat> Education. I went to school when they still taught grammar. When erasers wiped predicates from blackboards and a red brick wall lent a hand as we clapped the chalk dust free. I went to school when recess was the fourth R, and everyone knew marbles was just a longer way of spelling fun. I went to school when diagramming sentences led to understanding what I really wanted to find was not an object, but the subject in my life. Tongue twisters. La poesia es vida. Poetry is life for 22 immigrant English as second language middle school students. For three hours each morning, they write about homes left behind in Colombia, Nicaragua, Panama, Mexico. A two week summer school in Patterson, New Jersey, where the Dominican Republic is not allowed to be spoken of in its vowel rich language of romance. La poesia es vida. When the students write, some make Puerto Rico the 51st state, not with an act of Congress or a vote by the people of San Juan, but by language. Others tell of the Andes sliding into the Pacific off the coast of Chile, a tale of foreign magic translated for domestic use. La poesia es vida. It wears down the lead in their pencils. It scorches the paper they write on. It rises like smoke, signaling new ways of saying what everybody knows without using any words at all. La poesia. Es vida. Thank you. Now on to Princeton. Roadhog, epigraph by William Carlos Williams. No ideas, but in things. Roadhog. A poem almost crashed into me on the Garden State Parkway a few miles from Patterson's Great Falls. Driving south in the passing lane, I was nearly rear-ended by a lyric. The lines pressed tight to my bumper like a nosy apartment dweller's ear against the wall of his next door neighbor. Though I was doing the speed limit, lines tailgated until frustrated I moved right out of the way. A stanza flashed past, then slowed so it was next to me. I eased off the gas, but the poem stayed even. I sped up a little, the lines did the same. It made no sense. I downshifted to third and swerved onto the shoulder. The words cut in front forced me down into second, then smoked their tires and disappeared in the traffic ahead. 
I pressed on wildly trying to keep up, but the poem was gone. In its wake, overheated cars steamed by the side of the road. Skid marks trailed to jackknife tractor trailers. Exits were clogged with vehicles scrambling to make their escape, while the lanes heading north slowed to a crawl with drivers rubbernecking to see what all the upset was about. I got off the parkway at exit 129 to continue south on the New Jersey Turnpike. Still shaken by my own heedlessness, I asked the man in the toll booth if any lines had passed. He nodded and said state police were chasing a reckless poem racing south. Days later, I learned authorities had found a rhyme parked on the streets of Princeton. It was jailed for driving under the influence. After being bailed out by some university undergraduates, the poem returned to Patterson, where the verse now falls free like rainwater. Thank you. Rear view mirror. Always drive in your rear view mirror was my father's only advice from his life spent behind the wheel of a mail truck. When other fathers were showing their sons how to tune an engine until it breathed smooth and powerful as a runner doing laps around the track, my father's instruction looked backward, where trouble could chase black men with sirens screaming, red lights flashing. He knew bad roads could be avoided, slower traffic passed, destinations reached because signposts marked the way. But what's behind was dangerous if it caught you unaware, passed, then cut in front to swerve onto a side street out of view. My friend's dad spent summer vacations barbecuing in their backyards, but my father used all his time off to drive our family west across four states for our yearly visit to his parents in Illinois. The slowly unfolding landscape of mountains, then fields tall with corn and acres flooded with soybeans was ignored in his search deep in the rear view mirror for whatever might be following us. No sooner had we arrived to bake in Peoria's red brick streets did we turn around to go back east, my father watching where we'd been. And always, the trips were uneventful. No accidents, no unplanned stops in restaurants or small town courtrooms. Now, whenever I drive, it's in my rear view mirror like a mailman making his rounds, cautious, slowly so the unexpected never happens. Whatever is behind stays behind or passes harmlessly on its way. In time, what lies ahead will fill my rear view mirror where I watch just like my father, so the past can't ever surprise me when it races to overtake me from behind. Thank you. Thank you. Tunnel vision. Right after I got to know her, she left for New York City to become a poet. Whether by train or bus or car, I don't know what she's been missing just the same. I've often wondered where one goes in the city to become a poet. Wherever it is, I doubt there's on-street parking in the poet's part of town. And suppose you did know just where to go, would you dare tell a cabbie? And surely, you'd exit a bus a couple blocks away just to make sure you weren't followed, the poet's calling being such a solitary affair and all. She must have known where to go, though, and could gain entrance into wherever she had to be because she disappeared without so much as a postcard teasing. Hi, wish you were here. If only she had waited, I could have given her the price of a ticket or gas or tolls or whatever it cost to get to the city because I was on my way there the very weekend she left. The only difference is I always return home to New Jersey in time for work on Mondays. Thank you. 
uh, send out for publication at some point. It's called Sam's Place, and uh, I'd like to read a few poems from it. It's a 102-page manuscript. Um, it's a compilation of my experiences in the military in South Vietnam, uh, coming home, and it uh, consists of uh, free verse and haiku, the free verse referring to uh, Vietnam and the return home, and the haiku uh, being the counterpoint, the dreams about America while overseas. Sam's Place. In my final year at college, during the riots of the 60s, my only problem being the sole black guy in Sam's bar off campus was not living up to everyone's idea of what I was supposed to be. I wasn't angry, at least not at anyone sharing my pitcher of beer, and I actually believed that people wanted to get to know each other. I know I did, or I thought I did, but I wasn't any more interested in integration than my drinking buddies were in me. If I really had cared that much about humanity, I would have learned more about the little Italian barkeep who let me into his place without any hassles. It shouldn't have taken his obituary 23 years after I came back from Vietnam for me to know he'd fought in Italy during World War II and had won two brand stars and a purple heart helping liberate his homeland. And I hadn't even marched on Washington. But seated in his tavern, I found the only way to belong was to join in ridiculing his shabby life, stuck seven nights a week until closing time behind a bar as he watched us college kids get drunk. There really must have been something worth dying for to risk his life in Italy. Whatever it was, it wasn't there in his noisy corner tavern where baby boomers weren't smart enough to recognize a real American hero who put it all on the line to give integration a chance to work in 1960s America. Servant Damore, epigraph. Every combatant proclaimed the name of the lady whose servant Damore he was. He was wont to look up to the stand and strengthen his courage by the sight of the bright eyes that were raining their influence on him from above, King Arthur and his knights from Bullfinch's mythology. I knew nothing about love until it hit me as Gary, Henry, and I drove to Princeton sitting three abreast, drinking beer in the front seat of a beat-up Chevy station wagon Henry called his princess. That's when I begged Gary to tell me where my high school sweet sweetheart was. I wanted to see her three years after she had sent a Dear John letter while I had been in Vietnam. Gary protested. He said it was best to be done with her, that she was engaged to be married in six months. But I persisted, pressing on like Henry Chevy, despite the reality that time had passed us by. Finally finishing the six-pack, Gary relented, succumbing to my plea she was the only girl I'd ever love. But she had given no favors to carry into battle, no scarf or veil or sleeve bracelet, just a dear John about a month before my tour ended overseas. Yet I swore to Henry and Gary I loved her, even as they counseled there was no such thing as love. If that was true, I thought, then there was no such thing as mortal combat. But I had faced that dragon, so there had to be a lady fair. Gary finally gave me her address as the Chevy wheezed on, bearing a knight drunk on romance, and his pledge to prove love was as real as his battle scars. Haiku. Clouds punctuate winter. Spring will follow this ellipsis in the sky. Dog tags. Depending on how you look at it, I was one of the fortunate ones. After high school, I didn't need to hit the road to find myself. I went to a college that tagged two letters after my last name upon graduation. 
Following that came the Army, and it broadened my identity to name, social security number, blood type, and religion stamped onto two dog tags worn on a chain around my neck. Handy information for survivors if the unthinkable happened. All through the jungles of South Vietnam, the most disorienting thing to occur was losing my dog tags on a chopper landing in a place I didn't want to be. Back at the su supply shack in Benoit, I had another pair inscribed. Everything was the same, my name, social security number, and A positive blood type. But where the army had first engraved Baptists as my religion, I instructed none be put in its place. None. It was the only four-letter word I could commit to in the middle of that obscene war. None. Somewhere on a mission in South Vietnam, I buried my Baptist past and resurrected a new faith. None. My identity, my catechism worn on a GI issue rosary around my neck. None. Please remember to repeat that word reverently if you happen to attend my funeral. Thank you. Haiku. First scent of summer, freshly cut grass, ripe green grown tall from spring rains. The uniform. The uniform has a life all its own in the back of my closet. It gathers dust and wrinkles after 30 years of non-use but still is able to steadily and stealthily work its way ahead of the clothes I daily wear to earn a living or impress someone. The uniform does not blush in apology for being out of fashion. Its OD green is, a, is as alive today with memories as it was when I wore it home from Vietnam where everything was some shade of green. The trees, the mountains, the mold growing between my toes. But once a month, the uniform presents its arms between straight shoulders on a hanger in front of everything I have to wear. Two rows of ribbons track a double line above the left breast pocket. The tiny silver musket wreathed on a blue enamel background is pinned above this rainbow splash of combat like some alien misshapen sun. The colors of where I've been and what I've done grow more vivid beneath this ever-nourishing illumination. Holy on each lapel are the crossed rifles of the infantry. There is no reason for me to wear the uniform again, yet it somehow works its way to the front of my closet once a month ahead of the suits and slacks, pushing the ties and sports coats out of the way. I never will outgrow the cut and fold of jungle-stained cloth. Even looking at it with war-weary eyes, I know it fits more perfectly today than it did when I wore it as a young man. That's the only truth I need to know before marching the uniform to the rear of my closet so I can look forward to another month of peace. Thank you. Haiku. Bluebird flies across my path. Spring sky is jealous and hides behind clouds. Bamboo viper. It was the length of my arm from fingertips to elbow hidden beneath a leafy blanket covering a jungle trail in South Vietnam. We called him Johnny Two-Step as we humped the boonies on missions that sought to search out and destroy the only humanity we had left. We had heard a GI could just take two steps if bitten by a bamboo viper before the venom snaking through him brought his war to an end. I don't know what made me look down before stepping into eternity, but I did. Something had tugged at my jungle fatigues and I froze before fleeing back to my unit. I had avoided touching everything Vietnamese while in the country I had volunteered to fight for. 
After I came home, only my poems reached out to offer any understanding. I was still running three decades later, trying to outrace the serpents chasing me. Lee Wynn, my Cambodian scout, was gone. Sal, my Cambodian lover, was gone. Nothing Vietnamese until a young woman smiled after I read my poems at a suburban bookstore. She told me her mother was from Saigon, then shook my hand and said, thank you. Before I could run away, she hugged me for the decision I had made. She thanked me again for stepping into her mother's world in spite of the poison that lurked there. Thank you. The two poems. Blooded. A half hour after the shots, the calls came through loud and clear. My RTO handed me the receiver. Congratulations, I was blooded. The first and third platoon leaders radioed their approval. No longer was I green like the jungle in which I was buried. Congratulations, I was blooded. My platoon had recorded its first kill, North Vietnamese regular, pith helmet, uniform, rubber tire sandals adorning a lifeless body. One bullet cleanly through his forehead. Congratulations, I was blooded. The enemy was dead, ambushed from behind a tree. Odd there was no blood visible draining from the body. Existence fled when the bullet hit its target, but the only thing that bled all over the jungle floor was my innocence. Congratulations, I was blooded. Thank you. I hate to end on that note. So I will read the last poem in my book. The Gentle People, it's for Del Fisk, who was the, was the daughter, the infant daughter of uh, my former book editor. The Gentle People. Before you become an adult, learn to recognize the gentle people. They are easily overlooked, like each day's first blush of sunrise when the world resumes its quest for gold. But they are there, the gentle people rising hungry in tenements or racing through suburban streets for trains to slip them into work. They kneel upon the prairie, sift the soil, wondering when the rain will come. The gentle people brush by on sidewalks like wind whispering through the forest. On weekends, they go to stadiums to revel in the other team's defeat. Look hard for the gentle people. They are everywhere, but wear no uniforms that identify whose side they're on. Most times, they are invisible. But you always must remember, you can see them in your mother's eyes and hear them in your father's voice. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. That was, those were really powerful. I hope you uh, soon get a publisher and we see those uh, in a book. Um, somebody back for the open mic. If you haven't signed up, please do. Welcome to the open mic. Friday. With a mind like a floating white cloud, fit to deal with libraries and labyrinths, even Wittgenstein's geometry of color or the image of Greece's dried out mask of a face terminally ill at 39, two people without dislike or suspicion. Next door is an Encyclopedia Britannica in the trash of libertarian neighbors who discourage their kids' sociability. It's so difficult to tell anybody why when trying to explain how Beethoven on his deathbed spent hours perusing dismally unneurotic Handel scores, explain Bach and Palestrina and Mozart, 
Perhaps Mr. Haydn, most of all, they mimic cheetahs on the Serengeti, serenely quiet in the grass at rest, now like Picasso and San Tropez, shielding a candle with his hand, watching his son's manic dance. Monday. Down St. James in the rain, we know we will have clear indecisis of a tangible culture quest, muddy shoes from Parliament Hill coming off Hampstead Heath, misunderstand a family's hot there in the drisk with hats and boots. Roz says it has to do with a kind of cabotage to drive past a prison like the one on Pretoria's Peytonville Road, its old tan plaster colonial walls. But the clouds are here, no sun, nowhere to run. They've put their hockey fields, duck pond walks on top of St. Albans Roman Forum Marketplace, the grass a coverlet mulching the hypocost and dragon's teeth buried here like more spring bulbs, fields of potsherds and coins ground in by cleats, where lies one British formula for continuity. Messages forever runic scrawled under stones on stones to counterman chance awareness. Some have a fragile portance and wavered ends. Thanks. Um, I wasn't going to read this one, but the idea that a haiku is about mashing nature and a human emotion, not just about 17 syllables, is really what Charles was working from. And um, I recently wrote a rather long poem, I mean, one page, um, using that, that haiku idea, but it's not a haiku. It's called Playing Favorites. The great biologist of the eye of octopi, never took my point that ocular and octopus walked hand in hand in hand in hand. His wife was a dancer, a belly dancer, with such a head of hair and mind and a body we all understood the biologist understood biology. I loved the two of them together and imagined the great auburn-haired girl, almost six feet tall, in a tutu of peacock feathers, dancing for him alone after we all went home from parties. She washed wine glasses, he bagged paper plates, tossing them at her deft thighs which caught them, and daintily her soapy hands put each one into the big black garbage bag filling. Whenever I read of octopi, I think of those nights. The wit and technical talk, her moving through the party, music before the Beatles playing loud, and then that sound, her dancing as she poured more wine into empty glasses. Forty years later, I read the octopus has a preferred arm toward the front, where its extraordinary eye, the preferred one, can better direct it. The rear arms act like legs, unless a rock bottom dwelling is in the way of a perhaps hidden morsel, then the octopus chasses, shall we say, with all eight legs landing on the rock, and it lifts up to reveal the scurrying fish or crab underneath. In terms of skill, octopus arms are created pretty much equal. All eight arms are capable of the same tasks, a scientist told the illustrious gathering. When a strange object approaches, several arms hold back in reserve of several kinds. Two arms explore, following the leader near the best eye, three probes in all that could be bitten off. There is a preferred order too, like dinner before dessert. From a possible 448 combinations, only 49 showed up, one, two, or three armed gropings, leaving four legs and a tail to balance the creature, all apparent head and tutu of such muscular curiosity and grace.
Thank you, Mike, <coughs> for the mic. <laughs> and thank you, Charles and Ms. Wiener. This is a fairly long poem. Earth, air, fire, and water. Empedocles says, ignorant of electricity, the white streak rooting about in his head. Words, what are words? Air, aria elements, Steinway pebbles stuck in pudding boulders. The muttering of dark matter, neutrinos and stars, crab apple petals, their white carpet argument in spring, its yellow leaf response in fall. What is their argument? It is that moonshine makes crabapple glisten, that neutrinos make stars glitter, that this is enough for living things. And water is a good place to live in, a good thing to be made of, too. The ocean mutters waves, fishes and shellfish and coral. Birds deserve air. Air is a free thing, an uplifting thing. The birds worked for, trading arms and wrists and fingers and thumbs for wings. A good bargain to keep feet for touching down on earth. Even such wonders as birds want to eat. Fire, what is fire? Fire is air, water, and earth, love and stress. It isn't electrical, and that's because imagination isn't white streaks, bolts of electric energy transformed into manhandled thoughts. Imagination is substance. It wells up blind, knobby feelings with prehensile cravings leaning from them, sticky places. They creep towards each other, and like dice strewn at random, sometimes cover up sevens, come up strangers good for each other, who stay together, stuck on each other, handling each other. And what fans fire? Waves of air marrying earth, maintaining a furnace at heart's core, stoked with matter, made plasma, fits of stress. Thank you. I have no choice but to uh, regale you with the first thing which I wrote, or should I say it kind of wrote itself and I was along for the ride. It was written in 1968 and it's called Three Questions. If I said that I would love you in a driving summer rain, and I said this without speaking, would you hear me? Would you hear me? If I were transformed by a Greek god into a bursting flash of sunlight, though my physical being never changed, would you see me? Would you see me? If I took you away until the morrow to make love beside a rainbow with our bodies never touching, Would you remember? Would you remember? I segue into the most recent written, thought through, created groups of lines, words that have a meaning that's especially relevant with the holiday coming up. I call it road rage. Whoosh, 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 the cars roll by, belching hosannas to an asphalt sky, steelmaker dreams flamed by ass gasoline lies. Whoosh, 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 the cars roll by. Cylinders that hum, radios that sing, behemoths that crush life to smithereens. Creatures that run, critters that crawl, don't stand a chance, no, none at all. Whoosh, 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 the cars roll by. Hard metal anthems, their battle cry. Nature's bounty must yield or die. 
whoosh, 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 the cars roll by. Over the years, their dimensions grow, more power, more height, more alter ego. A squeal of brakes, a heart sickening scream, young lives twisted on 413. Whoosh, 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 the cars roll by, invading the promise of our pilgrim's pride. How can we celebrate the 4th of July when whoosh, 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 the cars roll by? Hear the Wind Blowing by Jim Weldon. Born naked with a will to soar as I, the spruce's winged seed must mine the clod. We're moved despite our dusty, fly, dusty lot to fly. The winged seed must fall, not hunt the sky. To grow it must be hold, it must be trod, bored naked with a will to soar as I. A seed that kited in the sky must pry the dark of that same earth. I have to plod, we're moved, despite our dusty lot to fly. It's fibrous upward thrust becomes a cry, whistled in branches, wind ripped and sawed, born naked with a will to soar as I. We rasp and thrum, the singing gone awry that tugs on anchored beings, mortal flawed, we're moved despite our dusty lot to fly. Daily the wind propels my song on high. It bears the spruces sawing far from sod, born naked with a will to soar as I. We're moved despite our dusty lot to fly. Thank you. It's Pat Cortez. And I have a short poem I'd like to share tonight. It's called, To the Stars, A Prayer. Far above, near God in the midnight, they are the moon's companions, ancient pointers of the way. They do not rise, but give their own light to the wanderer below. O oh, stars, are you truly signs of God's way? That's it, thank you. I'm Amadeo Diodamo. Uh, much of what I write is, um, has a political cast to it. This poem is called Hannibal, Cato, and Me. Hannibal was not a man of peace. Neither were my Roman ancestors. They were just better at war than the Carthaginians. <laughs> so they owned the neighborhood from irrepressible, unpredictable Venus to the frostbitten toes of the Alps. Winds from Africa brought the seasonal rain. For the fields of grape and grain, the knobby olive trees, the pines of Rome, burden prizes for parched Carthage. I was 12, exploring my more private parts. Didn't you do the same? It was then that I heard of the Punic Wars, but I thought the argument at the Sunday tribal dinner table was about the pubic wars. <laughs> Which made sense. My ancestors won wars by grabbing their enemies by the short hairs and then hanging on. <laughs> Hannibal was not a man of peace. His elephants ferried to Spain were not for the amusement of the children of Rome. Soon the Roman street began to twitter about his massive weapons of destruction. Hannibal and his elephants crossed the Pyrenees at Perpignan. I went there once, but not in full battle dress. Truly, at the pass into France, I caught a whiff of old elephant dung. Roman legions never chanted, hell no, we won't go. <laughs> Battle hardened, they invaded the African homeland. Hannibal, 
retreated to a brutal peace. It's strange, though. Some humans cannot stand any kind of peace, even a peace they imposed. Cato the Elder end, ended every Senate speech demanding that Carthage, no, Carthage <laughs> be destroyed. He was actually the inventor of the phrase, three strikes and you're out. <clears throat> so with the Third Punic War, Carthage was no more. It was then my ancestors created the concept of a Pax Romana. Not that they were interested in a general peace, but only a Roman one. After all, to become the world's only superpower, isn't that worth your young men dying in battle? Hannibal and Cato were not people of peace, are we? Hi, I'm Joan Goldstein. The poem I'm going to read, which I call Jet Lag. Asleep in Princeton, but my body, my rhythms, my own Chicadian music is alive and stirring in Romania, in Yash, still. As I wake at 4 a.m. looking for the flower-filled terrace, for the lines of swaying cypress trees, the skyline shaped by the onion domes of churches, brilliant red or yellow rolling streetcars, people moving through the parks, my breakfast of intense bursting red tomatoes, soft white cascaval cheese, apricot and plum jams, honey, yogurt, and the quiet of the scene, except for an occasional Romanian wedding at the hotel that amplified by shouts and harsh singing, awake me, and throughout the night in the city of Yash, I am sleepless. This is about um, the right de passage of um, launching a child for college and also their experience. Buttoning of an era. Independence is an American goal. Offspring leaping into the cauldron of higher education and lower instincts to show they are adult enough to make it. Denying the omnipresent lifelines that connect us and the etched expectations that bind us. In my head, I carried a list. Life skills to acquire before you departed. Ordinary skills like baking brownies, mixes from the box, not a problem. Academic skills like breaking a big project into small steps. Advancing to timely completion, not sleepless nights. Romantic skills like surviving rejection or breakups on your feet, knees only slightly bent, with scrapes that heal quickly and cleanly, no festering sores or broken egos. Last, not least, sewing buttons. Pride in appearance without beseeching friends or paying a tailor. I almost skipped that lesson in your nonstop life of weighty assignments and flute auditions, reattaching a button was such a trifle. A signpost from a different age when deft stitches defined women. Then the jacket buttons started popping. Threads frayed, not a button lost. Was this the complicity of maternal ancestors, vexed by your ignorance of their basics. Two buttons loosened before the audition in Chicago. The first I sewed, you warily watched. The second you did, framed by my handiwork at the start and finish. More buttons launched prior to, new, to a New Brunswick audition. You tackled these with reluctant familiarity. 
with me in the room for support. I could hardly believe it. Two more fell as you readied for Montreal. With not too much prodding, you managed this junction in your room unaided. Did the buttons clinch it? You now ready to burst through the last filmy layers that swaddled you? I ready for your release? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to break for the summer, and we'll meet again in, uh, I think, the third Wednesday in September. I'm not sure the exact date, but we'll be putting notices in the paper. So thank you all for coming. Thanks again, Charles and Arlene. Thanks.